My name is Ben Smith. Um, that, that's actually my real name. Um, I've been told before that I should use some hacker alias for this talk, um, but honestly, Ben Smith is um, pretty common as it is. Um, and I am actually am going to be talking about hacking. So a lot of people say, oh, you're, you're talking about hacking on gems, right? I'm actually talking about hacking with gems. So I'm talking about you know, getting credit card information or rooting boxes. <laughs> so just to be clear on that. Um, I've actually thought about renaming my talk to how to get rich quick and maybe not go to jail. Um, <laughs> with that in mind, my, my legal counsel, or counsel has asked me to read you this following statement. I cannot be held accountable for anything that might happen to you if you install my gems or anyone else's gems and some other stuff. Um, so real quick before I get started, I, I want to tell you a little bit about, about who I am. Um, I'm, I'm a Rails developer. Um, I've been doing Rails since 116. I work at Pivotal Labs and I uh, live in Boulder, Colorado. Now, just a bit about what I'm not. I'm not a security expert at all. Um, I have a fascination in security, but I don't have any background, no training. Uh, I, I like going to DEF CON every year, but 90% of the content goes way over my head. Um, so as I'm showing you these gems and these examples, um, keep that in mind that they're written by a complete noob. Anyone could do this. This doesn't take an elite hacker to do any of this stuff. Um, that being said, please don't try this at home. Um, it would actually be better <laughs> if you just forgot everything here that I'm about to tell you, except for the last few slides. Um, this picture actually looks like, that looks like a horrible idea. The funny thing is, a lot of these gems are kind of interesting and fun, and you start thinking about it, and you're like, oh, I could do that. That's kind of interesting. You have another idea, and then you go, like, oh, I could actually do this. But don't, just, just don't. <laughs> um, this talk is a little bit conflicted. On one hand, I'm telling you, you know, how to avoid um, bad things happening to you. At, on the other hand, I'm showing you how to write malicious gems. So um, with knowledge comes power. Use that wisely. So how this all started. Uh, a couple years ago, um, I had a client come to me, and he wanted to know what was in his app. He wanted to know what dependencies were there. He just wanted to have some sort of handle on what was going on. He wasn't super technical a little bit, and so I showed him the gemfile.lock, and that satisfied his curiosity. Um, but it got me wondering, what's the worst that could happen? What could a malicious gem do? Um, and what would be the worst possible thing that could happen to that client? Um, Rails has somewhere in the order of 39 different dependencies. So what if one of those dependencies in Rails was actually malicious? Um, if you're the visual type, this is a dependency graph for Rails, a, a standard Rails project. Right out of the box is what you get. So what if something in there was bad? Um, I was thinking that, well, the worst thing that I could imagine happening was that customers, private data um, could get compromised and all their customers could lose faith in the product and then you know, the whole thing collapses. So I thought, how hard would it be to write that gem? So I, I decided to write this gem. Um, I called it Awesome Rails Flash Messages. And I, I decided right away, no one would install a gem that was openly malicious. So I had to create something that appeared to do something different. Um, it's arguable whether or not this gem actually does anything useful at all, but at least it's just not hacking you. So what it does, it takes a typical Rails Flask messages, right, um, and makes them more awesome. <laughs> That's all it does. All caps, <laughs> exclamation points, some ones littered in there. Um, totally useful. You should definitely use it. Uh, but. There's some side effects. So if you, if you cracked open the source of this gem and started poking around, you might see something like this. Um, it's kind of odd here, right? If this evaluates to true, then it writes your params to something called development.log in your public directory, which doesn't sound quite right. And then on top of that, it takes your params and posts them off to a web service somewhere. <laughs> so if we go back, um, this line that if params to us matches something, 
is actually looking for passwords. So if the params your Rails app got includes like password somewhere in there, um, then it's going to do all this stuff. So anytime you have you know, a user logging in or signing up and passwords passed to it, it's going to write something like this to this development.log file. Um, clear text, emails, and passwords. Um, and since it's in a publicly accessible place, I can just go to your app slash development.log and just see it more. Of course, I don't even have to do that because it's also posted somewhere else on the internet. So no problem there. And now I have usernames and passwords, or emails and passwords as it is. Um, so there's this, this internet meme. You probably are all aware of it. Um, step one, you do something. Step two, you do something else. Step three is always these question marks. You never know what you're supposed to do there. But step four is always, always profit. Um, and that's where we want to get. So if I was to fill this out with some, uh, some real examples here, um, I would say step one is write a gem that does something. All right, I got that. Add code to harvest emails and passwords. Check. Use emails and passwords on banking websites to transfer some money. And I got profit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no problem. Um, but I think there's like one more step that needs to happen. Um, and I think you got to <laughs> flee the country. Uh, yeah. I don't think the FBI likes you stealing money from people. Um, and I'm not an expert on the subject. But according to the internet, the US doesn't have extradition laws with 54 different countries. <laughs> so if you want to come visit me later, I'll probably be at one of these places. <laughs> but before I leave, um, I thought, that was easy. W what else can I do? So I decided to write another gem. Um, I called it Net HTTP Detector. Um, and I wanted to detect the hack from my awesome Rails flash messages. So this thing logs calls to uh, net HTTP. So if I was using that awesome Rails flash message gem and I added this into it, I would get these things in my logs. Basically, it's not formatted well or anything, but it's basically telling me that something got posted out to some Heroku app on the internet, um, and I should be aware of that. Um, if you look at how it works, it's just, defining post form um, and allows you to log what's going on. And it also defines a valid post form. So if you wanted to do some, you know, get your post on your own, you could do that without it having to log everything. Um, but it does one more thing. So in one of the files, somewhere in this gem, the very last line, it has this one line. And it's basically grabbing some code from somewhere on the internet and evaluating it. So what, what, what does that code do? Well, it's a level four filter that looks for this DB console param. And if it sees it, it does some active recordy type stuff. So let's, let's look at what, how that affects our app. Um, if you take a normal Rails route, such as you know, user sign-in or any other route that you have, and you add this little DB console param, you'll get a nice little interface database access. So now you can do things like show me all the users, make myself an admin, make a database user. So the moral of this story is careful of wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, and if we go back to our five-step uh, five program again, we can fill this out. I wrote a gem. I added code to get access to the database this time. Uh, and with that database access, I can just, you know, hopefully get some personal info on people, <laughs> apply for a boat loan, profit, and then get out of here and go to a beach someplace. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I was looking up these countries, I made like a low Google map. Um, but right when I, I, I typed into Google, which countries do not have extradition laws with the United States? And I hit enter, and right after I did that, I'm like, I probably should have done that on a public computer. <laughs> <laughs> now I am on some government watchdog list someplace. Yes. Yes. Anyway, so I, I got database access. Awesome. And I thought, well, that was easy. What else can I do? So I wrote a third gem, better date 2s. And I'll tell you what it claims to do. Strips extra white space off of the 
two S date formats in Rails. It's something that annoyed me. Um, but that's not the only thing it does. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice a theme here. None of these things actually do what they claim to do. Uh, so what, is, what, what does it actually do? Well, um, it calls this method set date formats for, and it passes the Rails environment uh, and the Rails root, which is strange. You probably don't need that for date formats. So let's see what that method does. Um, well, it's a little bit hard to tell what's going on there, and that's because that's um, compiled C code. So this gem uh, doesn't have the source. It's pre-compiled for your platform. Um, it's not distributed with the source at all. Um, but since I'm nice, I'll, I'll show you what the source was um, before it was compiled. This is what it looks like. Can anybody tell me what that does? <laughs> all right. So if you, if you use this gem and you deployed it into production, you'd end up with something called assets.tar.gz in your public dir. And if I was to download that and extract that tarball, you'd see something like this. And that's your Rails source. That's the source code of your application. So now I have all your source code, all your intellectual property. Um, but a little bit of truth about this. This gem doesn't actually work. It could, but I'm pretty lazy. Um, it's what you call a fat gem, which is a, a gem that's pre-compiled for specific platforms and can be distributed without the source code. But it took me more than a couple hours to try to figure out how to do it, and I was like, ah, this is hard. And not only that, what am I going to do with your source code? Can I sell it to the Russians? Is that still a thing? Or is it the Chinese now? Do I put that on eBay? So I thought, ah, screw all that. That's, that's too hard. What else can I do that's easier? So I did what I always do. I wrote another gem. I called this one Be Truthy. How much truth do you think this one will have? All right, this is what it does. Um, our spec matchers are, are uh, kind of liars. It's a pet peeve of mine. Um, it doesn't. Act to be true or true be false don't, doesn't actually assert against true or false. It's truthy or falsy. Um, so what this, what this gem does is um, add some matchers that make things like user.new that should be true fail, because that's not actually true. True that should be true, that should pass. User.new that should be truthy, yeah, that sounds good. So this, this fixes that little pet peeve of mine. But let's talk about what it actually does. It actually doesn't do anything. It's just an empty gem. There's no functionality there. Um, it could have been because I didn't get around to finishing it, or probably was just because I got tired of writing useful code and just went straight to the hack. I'm lazy, like I said. Um, but if there's no code there, where is the hack? So if we, we poke around, um, the source tree looks fine. The source code looks good. There's actually, like I said, there's no code there. That's all that's, all that's there. Um, so if there's no code, what's, what's the catch? I heard gem spec there. Nice. Um, when you install this gem, it says, building native extensions, this could take a while. And what this means is it's, there's usually output when you're compiling some, some C extensions. Um, but if we look back at the source tree, um, there wasn't any C files. And you probably don't need C to build an RSpec matcher. So let's dig some more. So the gem spec. If we popped open the gem spec of this gem, you see this line, gem extensions uh, equals rake file. And what this is doing is it's saying, run the rake file at install time. So keep this in mind. This is at install time. This isn't when you require the gem. It's not when you execute the code. This is at install time. Um, but if we look back at the source tree, there's, there's no rake file. So where to go? Well, like I said, um, this stuff happens at install time. So if you ran gem install or bundle with this gem, stuff has already happened. Something's already happened. Um, so if we look at the source tree, before you install it, this is what it would look at like. It's a little bit different. We have a rake file, and we also have this temp.rb file. 
So what does the rake file do? Remember, this is a rake file that runs at install time. It copies this temp.rb file um, into the user's home and hides it as .temp. It then proceeds to alias sudo in your bash profile and points it at this .temp file. And then it removes itself. The last line of the rake file says, remove yourself, and then it's gone. So right after the gem gets installed, the file's gone. Um, and the only evidence that anything happened was the one line of the gem spec and the one line of the output when you did the bundle or the gem install command saying it's compiling C extensions. Um, so the question now is, uh, what does sudo do? I aliased it, right? It's pointing to that .temp file. So what does it do? Well, it kind of does what sudo normally does. Prints out a warning, grabs a password, and then runs the real sudo with whatever you wanted to run it with. Um, of course, it grabbed your password, so now it can do more stuff. And it does. Uh, it enables SSH, creates a user and sets their password, and then it tells some web service that there's a box that's ready to be SSH'd into. So now, what can I do? Yep, rooted your box. So what's the takeaway from all this stuff? Don't use my gems. I started presenting these um, for the first time at a lightning talk at Mountain West um, a year ago, exactly a year ago. And um, the biggest takeaway from everyone was, ah, I'm never going to install any of your gems. I don't care what it is. I'm never installing anything that you write. I was like, fair enough. Um, and I've actually garnered a reputation now where literally no one will install my gems. <laughs> I wrote a gem and I asked friends to like, hey, can someone test this out for me? And the only place I'd install your gem is in a VM. <laughs> Sounds like a challenge to me. <laughs> <laughs> so how can I get you guys to install my gems? You guys are smart. You're only going to install gems that you trust. You're obviously not going to install my gems. But you will install gems you trust. So what gems are trustworthy? Rails, RSpec, Sinatra, those all seem safe, right? Everybody uses those. You have to trust all their dependencies, dependencies as well, but it's probably a safe bet. So how can I add my code to some already trusted gems? If you're not going to install my gems, then might as well just skip that whole step. Um, I don't think this is going to be as easy as submitting a pull request. But I had this thought, and I went back to my btruthy gem. And I did one more thing. At install time, it grabs your gem cutter credentials and your list of installed gems and posts them to a web service. So now I own your gems. And hopefully you guys wrote some trustworthy gems. Because now I'm about to clone your repo, add my own malicious code to your gem, build your gem, and push it up to Ruby gems. And the kicker is you won't even know that this is happening. Because there's no notification that a new version of your gem has been pushed. You would have to go onto rubygems.org and check the version number or update your own gem, and who does that? And I was able to do all that just by grabbing your little gem cutter API key from the publicly readable gem credentials file. That's all I needed. So do people trust your gems? It's not about me anymore. It's about you guys. Do people trust your gems? And do people who install your gems have trustworthy gems? And so on and so forth. It becomes viral, right? So. I add my code to your gems, and your friends install your gems, and it goes bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, I hit one of the dependencies of Rails. But there's still one problem. How do I, how do I get the first set of people to install my gems? How do I bootstrap this entire viral aspect? Um, I can't really ask my friends to install my gems anymore. That doesn't work. <laughs> I tried being popular for a while, so I wrote this social experiment gem. 
and I wrote a script that constantly downloaded it all day to keep it at the most downloaded today gem. <laughs> it didn't work though, I got one download. <laughs> and actually th this leaderboard is gone now, so that doesn't work. So how else can I get people to install my gems? Conferences are good. People talk about libraries and gems at conferences. I've seen several like libraries thrown around at this conference. Um, Webmock was mentioned a couple times. RSpec Given, Quacky, that one can't be harmful. <laughs> but gi giving a talk is hard, um, and I'm lazy. <laughs> so how could I get you guys to install my gems without actually giving a talk? So I came up with an idea. I don't know if it, have you guys seen these? Have you guys seen these? Who did that? I did that. That's my gem. <laughs> don't worry. It doesn't do anything harmful except for harm your ego. I did the same thing at Aloha RubyConf, um, and I got 5% adoption, which was decent. Um, who, installed, who installed my ancient city Ruby gem? <laughs> A few people. I know there's more of you out there, because that's who installed it. So, so I got 7.5%. I'm doing a little bit better. I'm working my way up. The question is, are any of you guys gem authors? Um, if, this, if I had done this for real, you know, I could have owned your boxes, owned your gems, and this is how I could have started this whole viral aspect. Um, I did kind of trick you guys. You know, I, I made that gem, and I like said, Oh yeah, there's free $50 off Bibble Tracker gift cards, um, which is true. I'll give those away. I might pay for them with your own credit cards, though. <laughs> so, uh, just watch for that on your statement. So what happens now? Let's say someone did do this for real, you know, at, at this conference or another conference. What would happen? Well. My guess is Ruby gems would probably go down after they realize other people's gems are getting compromised. Um, Heroku deploys would go down, and I would end up on a beach someplace. <laughs> uh, this is basically what happened, um, or this is what happened a couple months ago with the, the YAML vulnerability getting exploited on Ruby gems. Um, and let's talk about that a little bit more. So Ruby gems went down, but only for a moment, and then they came back up again, and they said. The only thing you can't do is push. You can continue to download stuff, which, to be honest, is kind of weird because they were worried that gems were being changed, but they still allowed people to download and install gems that were already up there. They really should have just stopped everything, stopped all downloads. Um, Heroku deploys went down for a minute, and then they said, all right, you guys can deploy, but you're going to have to use your own custom build pack, and they basically made it a little bit harder for you and said, you can do it, but you should be aware that there's issues here. Um, and the recovery from all that, from that attack, was um, RubyGems knew when the, the exploit started. They knew at what time. And they were able to compare gems prior to that to ones that were current. And they said, like, prior to the attack, these gems were good. And then after that, they are who knows what. So let's compare them. And they were able to do comparisons and say, all right, nothing's been changed. Everything's good now. Um, in my case, if I'm stealing gem cutter credentials, there's no way to really do that. I'm basically stealing usernames and passwords. There's no single point in time this could occur over weeks or months. And it would be very hard for RubyGems to say, well, this is when it started. And we can say that everything before this is good and everything after this is bad. Um, it would be quite difficult. Um, so what now? How, how, how do we keep all of this from happening? Well, some of the gems I talked about um, 
have easy things you can do to detect that they're doing something crazy. Um, so the awesome Rails flash messages gem posted out to a, a web service. Um, so there's network traffic there. Um, and you can use a tool like Little Snitch to monitor your net network traffic. Um, in this case, you can see that iTerm is running my Ruby process, and that made uh, a post out to some Heroku app. So it's fairly easy to monitor this stuff and keep an eye and make sure nothing weird's going on. The Be Truthy gem is the one that modified your bash profile, right? Um, so this made file system changes that shouldn't. And in this case, um, FS Eventer is a great tool for monitoring your file system. Um, in this case, it's showing that there's changes to the dot profile and dot temp file. And what you can do is you can start this thing up right before you install a gem or right before you decide to use it and, you know, do a gem install and see what files it touches. The other thing with the Be Truthy gem was the exploit was triggered at gem install time. Um, and so never gem install gems that you aren't very comfortable are non-malicious, right? Don't gem install from strangers. Um, what you really want to be doing, if you don't trust a gem, is fetching it first. When you do a, a gem install, it downloads the gem and installs it immediately. If you do a gem fetch, it will download the gem and it won't install it. It'll just sit there. And then from that, from that point, you can unpack it and see the contents. And that will allow you to see the malicious code before the install script runs and the rake file got removed, right? And you know, at that point, you're already screwed. Doing a gem install is basically like downloading something from the internet and just saying, run it right away. Um, or if you're not from Windows land, doing this. Does this look familiar to anybody? <laughs> Everybody's done this. I, I've done it. Um, it's executing arbor arbitrary code from the internet. Of course, in both these cases, you know, we choose to trust um, rvm.io or fileplanet.com or whoever else. But with gems, you're basically choosing to trust all of rubygems.org. Um, and anyone can put gems on Ruby gems, including me. <laughs> so if you want to trust the gems that are on rubygems.org, you should really be installing, it, installing them with Dash P high security. Um, and this requires signing of the gems. Um, and in theory, what this gives us is the ability to track back the author. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the gem isn't going to be malicious, but it should allow you to get back to that author, get back to a real person that wrote that gem. Um, of course, that requires a high level of adoption to actually work. And if you try to run this, if you try to install Rails with dash p high security, you basically don't get anywhere. Active support isn't signed. So what we really need to do is start building our gems with certs. And it's very simple. It uses a basic public private key, you sign your gem with your private key, you distribute your public key, and anyone who has your public key can install and verify that you're the one who built that gem. Um, of course, you have to make sure that your private keys don't get compromised the same way. I grabbed the gem cutter credentials, but that's another story. There are a couple of projects around gem signing out there. Um, they're attempting to beef up the whole system. They haven't got a whole lot of traction yet, but it is starting to move in a good direction. Um, another completely different option to all this is doing sandboxing, um, creating like a sandbox like a VM where you can install and test gyms in an environment that can get trashed without having to worry about it. Uh, we could also, someone could fork rubygems.org and um, actually send notifications when new versions of your gems get pushed. Um, that way, at least when someone does own your credentials, you'll get notifications that they're pushing new versions of your gem. We could write tools to de detect malicious code. Um, and this would be awesome if this was integrated into Ruby gems, because then every push could potentially flag a, a gem and say, this might have malicious code. Um, this is a hard problem to solve, but still a possibility. Private gem repos are nice. Um, you could literally go through every line of every dependency and vet it and make sure that there's nothing malicious. Throw in a private repo and just install stuff from that private repo. I've heard that 
there's a couple of companies that are out there doing this now. Um, and I think there's potentially an opportunity for a service that does this where you pay someone to go through and manually vet all your gems. Of course, all this stuff is really hard. Um, there's no silver bullet here. There's nothing that we can do that will protect us in all cases. Um, but the one thing I'd like everyone to do is don't try this at home. <laughs> the Ruby community is very, very kind and supportive. And let's keep it that way. Um, but maybe you take away from this talk the following few things. Don't install gems you don't need to. Favor writing code yourself rather than installing some gem that got suggested on some Stack Overflow post. Um, if you're just trying to fix some small issue, just write it yourself. Pay attention to what your gems do. Um, if you have some RSpec matcher gem, it shouldn't have C extensions, for example. Monitor your system, little snitch and FS Eventer were the couple that I mentioned to do this. And of course, read the source, because that's where the rubber meets the road. And there's one more gem. And this one's not malicious, I promise. <laughs> you can choose to install it or not. Uh, Coal Mine Canary um, detects potentially a dangerous environment. It kind of does the things that I, I um, showed examples of, like modifying your bash profile, trying to grab your gem cutter credentials or post out to a web service. And basically, it tells you when you install it, it's doing some pen testing, and here's the results. And it tells you what it was able to do. So in my case, it was able to post to a web service, it wrote to my bash profile, it grabbed my gem cutter credentials, and it read my, read my SSH keys and known hosts, and I killed all of my canaries. So try that out. It's kind of fun. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is conferences always inspire me. I come to conferences, I learn about new things. Um, I hope that this talk didn't inspire you to write malicious gems. <laughs> But I hope it was at least entertaining and eye-opening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.